Good afternoon. Welcome to the Commonwealth Club of California. I'm Celia Menchel, chair of the club's member-led Middle East Forum, one of many member-led forums at the Commonwealth Club doing a variety of programming. You can find out more about member-led forums and other upcoming events at commonwealthclub.org, but I would like to mention one. It's the club's virtual fundraising gala on October the 16th with wonderful speakers and prizes, and you can go to commonwealthclub.org to find out more about that event. Before I turn the program over to our distinguished moderator, Eddie Simonian, I'd like to show a two minute video from Israel 21C featuring some views of Israelis on the street in Tel Aviv talking about the UAE Bahrain Israel deals. Thank you. What do you think about the peace deal? Very good. I think this is a very important that we should be in peace all over the world. I'm very glad. I'm very happy. I think it's very good. I think it's going in the, in the right direction. I don't think there is any why for peace. Peace in itself is the answer. I think it's good. It brings people together, if anything. Well, I love peace. Well, I really hope that it will bring peace and that it's not only commercial, I think it's great that we have normalization with uh, more uh, Arab countries, but to call it a peace deal is a bit uh, it's a bit too much. It's basically a normalization between two countries that had some relations before, and I hope we can get to real peace with countries that are really considered our enemies in the near future. Peace is only, always excellent with any country, especially with our countries. Peace deal. I don't know, because uh, we never had war with them. I hope it's going to bring uh, good, good things for Israel. When I think about the business, this is great. We are looking forward to it. Sorry, I don't. So it's probably like here, this is Bahrain. That's Kuwait. It's in uh, here, something. Maybe this one? No. No. Maybe this? It should be somewhere here. Maybe this green piece. That's Qatar. It's an island near the Saudi coast. Probably here. Exactly there. Okay, I knew that it's a little island. But possibly it's here. How did you know? First of all, you marked it with a star. It's not important. We are very small, so what? It's like uh, this neighborhood, 1.7 million uh, residents. It's very small. I don't know how. I don't know numbers. Seems like uh, even more small than Tel Aviv. <laughs> Hope to see you there. <laughs> California. I'm Eddie Simonian, the vice chair of the Middle East Forum. I'll be your moderator for today's program, the UAE and Bahrain deals with Israel. Tonight's program and the club's new virtual efforts are generously supported by the Ch Chan Zuckerberg Initiative and a collaborative of local funders and donors. We are grateful for their support and hope others will follow their example to support the club during these uncertain times. We invite everyone to visit us online at www.commonwealthclub.org. And a reminder to please send your questions for the question and answer period to chat. We begin today's program with an overview by Dr. Benefshe Kainouche, a foreign affairs scholar and educator who earned a PhD in international law and diplomacy. She is the author of Saudi Arabia and Iran and editor of the forthcoming book, Iran's Interregional Dynamics in the Near East. Please welcome Dr. Benefshe Kainouche. Thank you very much for having me on this program. Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, we have a peace accord before us, and the fundamental question for me personally when I look at it is to what extent that does this accord or accords with Bahrain now having joined um, fundamentally shifts the power dynamics in the Middle East region? And by that, I mean how it specifically shifts the relationship um, between the Arab core countries of the region 
and the so-called um, and I'm sorry, I'm using the phrase periphery, but but traditionally periphery states have referred to Turkey, Israel, and Iran, which are, which are the non-Arab uh, countries of the region. Historically, the periphery, these three um, uh, non-Arab countries, no matter what their differences, had a fundamental interest, which was to ensure that the core Arab states of the region are unable to encircle them. In other words, that their power does not exceed theirs um, and because each has in some form or manner uh, been threatened or felt threatened or has perceived threats from the Arab core states. Now with Israel uh, forming a peace accord uh, with Bahrain and the United Arab Emirates, um, which is an extension of a peace process that the Trump administration initiated uh, as early as January 2020, the question is, um, to what extent will, uh, will Israel be able to consolidate its partnerships with the Arab core to fundamentally alter the core periphery relationship? Where we stand now is Turkey and Iran as two so-called periphery states feeling somewhat cornered by the peace uh, accord, by the Abraham Accord. Um, the United Arab Emirates and Turkey have had disagreements since at least 2016, 2017, and this seems to mark an escalation of sorts in that disagreement, and it does boil down uh, to their spheres of interest in the region, especially with the UAE becoming more assertive uh, within the region. Uh, Iran feels cornered because it has felt threatened by Israel and its um, fundamental goal since the Islamic Revolution in 1979 has been to keep Israel at arm's length. It's safer to keep Israel as, uh, at arm's length rather than to get into an immediate conflict with Israel along Iran's borders. With the Abraham Accord, Israel is moving a step closer to Iran's borders, specifically because it is in discussions to consolidate military agreements with the United Arab Emirates. Um, Iran is not the only country watching this agreement, this accord with a level of apprehension. Uh, another powerhouse in the region, the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia, is also weighing its options toward the accord. Um, Bahrain, which is um, very close to Saudi Arabia, has agreed to join the accord, perhaps as an extension of a level of Saudi acquiescence or an agreement in uh, toward peace of a broader peace uh, within the region. Of course, Saudi Arabia says that um, its agreement uh, with Israel should be subject to a Saudi peace plan that was forwarded uh, by the late King Abdullah in 2002. But essentially the core of the plan does extend ex uh, a recognition to Israel in return for um, a significant portion of Palestinian um, uh, claims to their land and territories that have been taken. So, um, Long story short, Saudi Arabia is not fun fundamentally opposed to a broader peace agreement with Israel. That worries Iran and it worries Turkey um, to an extent. Um, and what is really fascinating in this picture is that Iran being isolated because of sanctions, because of its general isolation since the Islamic Revolution has developed a more um, paranoid position toward the accord. Iran thinks that it is laying the ground to divide the region even further and even territorially to divide Iran at some point uh, and even Saudi Arabia, both Iran and uh, Iran specifically Saudi Arabia, much less so, do have concerns about this issue. Uh, to what extent will the United States be able to consolidate its hold on the region and its interests on the region through this Abraham Accord by creating a new axis in which the United States is at the center of it and Israel to its right and a couple of um, smaller Arab countries to its left and Saudi Arabia kind of being having to go, go along with the arrangement. Uh, so from Iran's standpoint, uh, it is looking at a very divided region very apprehensively and trying to figure out whether this accord will stand or not, um, somewhat hoping that maybe once the Trump administration leaves office that things might alter in Iran's favor so that it can explore and exploit the fault lines in this accord. My colleagues here today will speak more about the fault lines um, 
There are many fault lines. The accord has ramifications for relations with Palestine and the Palestinians, for relations in Syria. Um, and uh, in the meantime, uh, Iran is trying to mobilize of those that are like-minded with it across the Middle East, even in Africa and other areas to explore more modalities to uh, encircle Israel even further. We can get into these details, but I thought that by way of an overview, I could just kind of brush over some of the immediate concerns uh, that exist in the region about this accord. And once again, reiterate that the true test of the accord is the extent to which it will significantly alter the power dynamics uh, within the region and then hold together as an agreement. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Kanush, for your comments. Um, next, we'll hear from Robert Rosenthal, who was a foreign correspondent in Africa and the Middle East. He was also the editor of the Philadelphia Inquirer, managing editor of the San Francisco Chronicle, and the executive director of the Center for Investigative Reporting, whose board he now serves on. Hi, good morning, uh, everyone, and thank you. Uh, well, I think this is, I think you have to look this as a positive step. I mean, any kind of normalization, quote unquote, treaties, uh, other than a state of war, obviously Bahrain and the UAE never met the Israelis on the battlefield. Uh, but the fact that they're willing to open up and do these things, uh, I think, is a positive step. Now, where, what it leads to is unclear. Obviously, uh, from a Palestinian point of view, uh, this is not a good deal. Uh, last time we spoke, uh, Netanyahu was still threatening, really, that there was, there was going to be major annexations in the West Bank. And it was put on a pause. And in a sense, the Israelis gave up or said they aren't, the annexation process would stop. They were taking back something they never really had done. So they really didn't lose much. Uh, the, the real backbone here and part of what was happening is that there were sort of under the radar covert relationships already underway between Bahrain and the UAE and Israel. Uh, this sort of formalizes it. I think that the next period of time if we see, quote unquote, actual things happening, uh, it's going to be important. And clearly, this is an alliance or an agreement, which again, splits more of the Middle East and, and comes back to the Iran, Saudi, Israeli split. So the enemy, enemy is my friend. Uh, and in this case, the UAE and Bahrain are not close to Iran and with the Saudis obviously form an alliance. How this will affect the ongoing war in Yemen uh, is unclear. In a way, it, it hasn't really been dealt with by the U.S. government. Uh, you know, the, the Middle East, like the, all of the world right now, is in a tremendous amount of chaos because of COVID. Uh, and we really are in an unusual time because one of the things that the globe realizes, uh, there's no boundary and no border that can stop a pandemic. So I do think that there are areas uh, that may be shifting in terms of how people work together, or countries work together. Uh, the leverage here will really be in terms of the Saudis, I think, and if the Israelis are willing to do anything in terms of improving the relationships with the Palestinians, especially in the West Bank, that we can see more things happen. And obviously, again, the backbone of a lot of this is money. Uh, if the Saudis are tacitly approving this, what are they going to do or not going to do in terms of the rest of the Arab world that supports them, especially can they make major investments in the West Bank at, over time and even hopefully in Gaza? Uh, you know, the reaction to this was pretty predictable. Uh, it's, you know, one of the things I haven't seen much about, and I'm curious about, and maybe we can talk about is what the Israeli Arab population thinks of this. And there's some um, potential things we may see in the months ahead. Uh, and I think it would be, and I know it could create more problems uh, if we can imagine a plane load of citizens from Bahrain or the UAE coming to Israel and wanting to go to Al-Aqsa, uh, for example, uh, and being welcome there. 
what will the WAF do, the organization that, that manages it? Will they allow other Arabs who want to be pilgrims to come there? I mean, this has never really happened this when it's very covert. So these are flashpoints that they've already said, the WAF, they don't, well, they don't, honor, they don't honor this accord and they don't want uh, citizens of the UAE or Bahrain to come. So, I mean, there's all these sidelights that we'll watch play out, uh, but it's again in the fractured Middle East racked by COVID. Uh, what's happened in Lebanon uh, in a country that's struggling dismally, not only COVID, but the aftermath of the huge explosion in Beirut. Uh, you know, Hezbollah has not been helped by that. Hezbollah has been weakened, obviously, by the war in Leb uh, Syria. And obviously, again, the Iranians are not in a powerful position right now with the sanctions and they're seeing these other alliances happen. So again, this is another unsettling moment. I think it's really too soon to make a strong judgment one way or the other, but I personally think that normalization over time, these are tiny steps, but if they can create more commonality between people who really don't know each other, the little vignette from the uh, video with the map was fun. I'm sure if we did that in the United States, nobody would know where these countries were, very few people. But I do think anything that opens potential dialogue and awareness and connections is a positive step. But there's, this is fraught with huge political issues and issues, obviously, that are historic and deeply rooted in the region uh, around animosity and lack of trust that haven't been ameliorated by this. But it is, I think, a small step forward. It also raises questions, you know, President Trump has said that he would have no objection to selling uh, F-35 fighter jets. He sees it as a business deal. Obviously, how those jets would be used by Bahrain or the UAE is a complication. And, and uh, again, uh, if you think in the sense of containing Iran, a lot of this from a military point of view, I think, is aimed at that. Thank you to Robert Rosenthal. Uh, I just want to remind everybody that you could ask questions uh, through the chat. Our third panelist, uh, Alon Sakar, worked on the Arab-Israeli peace during the Bush and Obama administrations. He is the co-author with Senator George Mitchell of the book, A Path to Peace. Uh, thanks, Eddie. I'm uh, glad to be here today. And I, I agree with um, Robert's take that the normalization of relations between the UAE and Bahrain is a positive thing. It's a very good development. Uh, both the UAE and Bahrain are regional business hubs and among the more successful economically Arab states in the region. Um, and it's important to look at how these agreements differ from some of the other peace agreements that Israel has with its neighbors. It remedies certain of the deficiencies between uh, uh, in the Israel-Egypt peace agreement, the Israel-Jordan peace agreement. Obviously, those are still absolutely critical formative agreements in the region, but those were confined generally to security issues, some minor economic issues, small-scale economic deals. Um, but there's a lot of volatility in the Israel-Egypt agreement and in the Israel-Jordan agreement. They're very much dependent on the uh, leadership in those countries uh, remaining and being bought in um, these deals are different, particularly because they focus on non-security things in addition to security, but there is a great deal in these agreements about tourism and social people-to-people -people things and economic connections. Uh, since announcing the, the agreements, um, both uh, the UAE and Israel have announced cooperation on COVID research and clean energy technology and other technologies in general. Um, and a senior Emirati officials have called this a people to people movement. Um, one senior Emirati official even called, even said that uh, uh, the Palestinian issue will not hinder uh, Emirati Israeli peace. And he said, I quote, not even a war with Gaza. So this I think has in, breaks down some important psychological barriers, uh, both uh, on, on all sides, obviously the way Israelis see their place in the region. Um, if anybody follows Twitter and you follow high level uh, Emirati officials on Twitter or the Israeli MFA, you'll see almost daily pictures of you know the Emirati and the Israeli flag uh, in Dubai in front of the Burj Al Arab or wherever it is. Uh, today, the um, uh, Emirati foreign minister, Abdullah bin Zayed, was in Berlin 
with the uh, Israeli foreign minister and the German foreign minister, and together they went to the Holocaust Memorial in Berlin. So there is sort of this overt, very intentional people to people um, uh, connection that the Emiratis and the Israelis specifically are trying to build with one another, uh, which is really a sea change. Um, now we can talk maybe in the Q and A section a bit about the timing of all of this, which uh, you know uh, there are certain implications. But and in terms of the Palestinian issue, um, you know the Palestinians obviously did not welcome this uh, these accords. They are understandably quite upset for being uh, left out and for for their issues not being addressed, and really. You know, the, the desire for Arab Israeli normalization has been has spanned Democratic and Republican administrations going back, you know, at least 30 years. And really, the, the first major initiative was the uh, President Bush's Annapolis Accords, in which he got representatives from the Arab states, from the Muslim countries to come to support the launch of peace negotiations. Uh, and ever since then, there's been more and more movement towards some kind of normalization. Obviously, as Banafshu was saying, the issue of Iran and Turkey and, uh, and kind of all the complexities of the Middle East, um, which you know the UAE and Israel and Bahrain and the Saudis for sure share many, many common interests. And what's been become apparent over the years and to you know to the uh, the chagrin of the Palestinians is that their issue is no longer as front and central as it was in the 80s and the 90s and even in the early 2000s. Um, and, and what this agreement does actually is flip the Arab Peace Initiative on its head. If you remember the Arab Peace Initiative back in 2002 set, was uh, an initiative um, in which the Arab states uh, and, and Muslim states said that they would you know, uh, have normalization for with Israel in return, um, in return for peace with the Palestinians. And now, what this is saying is that no, actually, we don't need peace with the Palestinians first, uh, and we'll have normalization with Israel anyhow. And so, obviously, the Palestinians uh, are feeling um, sidelined here. But uh, you know, this could actually be good for the two-state solution if it's used for that way. Um, the Palestinians aren't going away. The need for the two-state two solution remains. Um, and as my former boss uh, said, uh, he said, Dan Shapiro is the U.S. ambassador to Israel, that, um, you know, history and common sense both show that Arabs that maintain some relations with the Israelis can play a more active role in support of the Palestinians than those who do not. And that's been true recently with Egypt helping to maintain a truce between Israel and Gaza. Jordan is in the past has applied a tremendous amount of pressure on the Israelis when it comes to issues on Jerusalem, also with annexation. Um, and there is, uh, you know, there is another reality here is that the Emiratis and the Bahrainis have a lot of money and they have the ability to really invest in and help support Palestinians and Palestinian society. And you know, they, there are so many things that they can do. Robert mentioned uh, uh, Gaza, but you know, they could help build up parts of East Jerusalem, help the school networks there and mail and um, uh, all throughout the West Bank, there, there's just a tremendous need for support in hospitals and schools. Um, and I think if Palestinians could start seeing some benefit to them of this peace agreement and this peace deal, the Emiratis, the closer they get with the Palestinians, also the more of a, a stronger role they can play in trying to help them meet their legitimate aspirations. Again, I go back to saying, I understand that the Palestinians are upset that this leaves them out and understandably so, um, but I do think that eventually this will play and can certainly play a very positive role. Thank you, uh, Alon. Uh, I'm Eddie Simonian, today's moderator. We'd like to remind our audience that this is a Commonwealth Club program called the UAE and Bahrain Deals with Israel with Dr. Benefshe Kainush, Robert Rosenthal, and Alon Sakar. 
Now it's time for the question and answer period. Uh, we have a large number of questions, so uh, let's begin. Uh, I'll start off with a question and it's uh, for all the panelists. And um, my question is, do these deals signal, signal the end of what is left of Arab nationalism and the Palestinian cause? And uh, maybe we could start with Dr. Uh, Benefshi. The um, pan-Arabism or Arab nationalism and the Palestinian cause have always been a, uh, subjected to political um, interests and phenomenon, not only by external actors, but by the Arabs themselves. They have politicized the subject way beyond the point of now trying to claim to salvage either the Palestinian cause or uh, pan-Arabism. Um, uh, you would have to be a hypocrite uh, to, to want to, to, want to uh, claim to salvage it when you yourself have, have politicized the subject uh, from, from the time of the Israeli statehood uh, uh, after World War II. And so I think that the Palestinians understand that the Arab the individual uh, Arab countries who are contemplating normalization with Israel understand that. And my um, best guess is that everyone is going to go after their immediate interests. Uh, which isn't ideal, but if, if normalization does consolidate, uh, as Alan was saying, economic uh, relationships in the region, that then they might uh, extend those interests to more me medium term and longer term interests to be able to incorporate normalization in a manner that also helps promote better Arab understanding and better Arab unity over the Palestinian cause. The very fact that countries like the UAE are on the alert about their response to the Palestinian cause post-normalization with Israel means that there are fundamental divisions among the Arab countries over how to address the issue and um, the extent to which they are each willing to politicize the issue. And of course, this politicization also enables countries like Turkey and Iran, which are non-Arab countries, uh, to have a say in the process, which further complicates uh, the issue. I don't know if I've answered the question, but this is just my take and understanding of it. Uh, Robert or Alon? Uh, I would say, oh, go ahead, Robert. Okay. Uh, you know, I think a lot of this, and it's been mentioned, honestly, uh, the Palestinian issue will not go away, but if the Palestinians over time, especially in Gaza, see their lives improve because of economics or billions of dollars that are put in place from the UAE, from Bahrain, from potentially Saudi Arabia, and there's a normalization of life and the, it will create a, I think a better environment and a more trusting environment for the Israelis to, to back off and maybe there will be a solution. Uh, Gaza obviously is, is, is a horrific, uh, conditions there that people live in are horrific uh, with tremendous neglect. And the West Bank was not as bad, but it really, uh, and we see this in history, uh, if you go back to the end of World War II, uh, with the Marshall Plan, with the U.S.'s Marshall Plan in Europe, and what it did in, in Europe, really rebuilding it, created a lot of stability uh, that has existed to today. Obviously, there are issues today that are, you know, 75 years later that we're dealing with. But uh, a, a quiet peace, uh, a normalization, uh, and I think in, in these accords, the what I'll call the human connections. Uh, of actually people getting to know each other could have a benefit. Uh, and obviously this is very difficult, but over time, I don't think, uh, when I say over time, that if there's an administration change in the US, the Biden administration is not going to uh, be unhappy about these accords. They will put more pressure, I believe, on the Israelis uh, than the Trump administration has to normalize relations with the Palestinians and make some steps forward. Uh, but I do think because of the financial reality and the wealth of these countries in the Gulf, and if the Saudis quietly or openly decide to get more involved, there will be leverage. Uh, people's lives can improve. And if that can happen, even with the pressures from Iran, uh, and that's why it's so risky for the Iranians, uh, 
uh, things may change. I mean, the dynamics there, and again, COVID has affected everyone, everything. Uh, the situation in Lebanon is obviously very different than it was 18 months ago or a year ago with Hezbollah. Uh, so I do think there's an opportunity here, and I do in general think these are positive steps, but the proof is going to be in what the investments are and we, where we begin to see the rhetoric change. I think things have to change on the ground in a positive way in the West Bank and Gaza slowly, slowly build this into a more lasting and positive situation. Alon, do you have any comments on this? All right. Thank you. Uh, uh, thank you, Dr. Benefshe and Robert. Uh, we do have a question and it is about, we see there's overpopulation uh, in Palestine and Israel and maybe to expand on this question, would this deal lead to a new Sykes-Picot involving Egypt, Jordan, Israel, and Palestine and redrawing of borders or bigger fights over these borders? Uh, if uh, anybody wants to chime in on that. I don't think there's any more. I mean, people have been for decades uh, imagining all kinds of different solutions and taking bits of land from Egypt, from Jordan and swaps of various kinds. And I don't think this, the UAE deal changes the likelihood of any of those uh, being implemented in the future. Um, uh, I, I just don't see a connection between those things. Um, if I could just um, add something here, I agree uh, with Alon completely. But uh, if you are sitting in Tehran and looking at this, for example, they would, they would see it completely differently. They think that a master plan, a grand Middle East plan is in the remaking again from the Bush era um, to redefine the borders of the Middle East. And this accord must certainly have something to do with it. Uh, given the fact, as Robert also mentioned, that even prior to the accord, the United Arab Emirates, Israel, Israel with a couple of the Gulf uh, Arab countries, was in discussions over security issues. Uh, and the Iranians have been monitoring those from afar very carefully and speaking about it for decades. Um, and um, th their intelligence is, is um, quite um, tuned <laughs> to be it a conspiracy theory or not, that this accord would eventually, if not uh, hampered, lead to the breakup of countries that are experiencing tensions within the region and internally like Iran, like Saudi Arabia, even Saudi Arabia, the Iranians have um, publicly um, warned the Saudis that this accord will eventually lead to the breakup of Saudi Arabia if Saudi Arabia refuses to take a leadership um, um, mantle of the Arab world, so called, so, so, so speaking, and uh, uphold the Palestinian cause. Um, and I don't think that the Saudis agree with Iran, but they are apprehensive about their leadership position in the Arab world. Um, if, 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 if the smaller Gulf countries like Bahrain, or, well, the United Arab Emirates, or even Israel or the United States eventually reach a point of having more say than um, Saudi Arabia about the Palestinian issue, about relations with Egypt, with Jordan, and how the kingdom has, has generally led those relations in its neighborhood, then we are looking at a region in the long term that will experience more tensions potentially, unless the US gets it right. Maybe Robert can tell us if that will happen. <laughs> I don't think I have the answer to that. If the US gets it right, I do think the US, uh, obviously has always had leverage. It really hasn't been used uh, that much. And you know, look at the ongoing fighting in Yemen, uh, where we're basically we're a weapons supplier uh, with lots of violations and human rights violations and lack of accountability. Uh, clearly the US Trump's administration's move in, in, in imposing more severe sanctions and dropping out of the nuclear deal with Iran have created chaos. And, you know, again, the factors in the last six years, the, the civil war in Syria has, you know, Syria has been decimated. Uh, it seems clear now Assad revived, but you still have, you know, Iran's involvement. We haven't mentioned the Russians 
uh, who you know are deeply entrenched in Syria. What's their view on this is sort of tacitly saying it's okay because any t- step towards normalization, the covert and sort of unusual relationship uh, between the Russian, clearly the Israeli military and, and ground rules around Syria. I mean, it, the, the region is so complicated and has been for so long, but in terms of the core issue here, in terms of the Palestinians, if there is an infusion, and I'll call it, I mentioned earlier, some kind of quote unquote Marshall plan for the West Bank and Gaza, that would be a huge improvement uh, on the ground. Whether that can lead to a two state solution, I have no idea. But you also have the dynamic, and everyone's waiting to see what happens in the American election. Uh, you know, right now, Netanyahu is not a very popular leader in Israel. We see demonstrations there around COVID, about corruption. There's a huge amount of uncertainty, but in general, normalization between normalization between countries in that region and Israel, I see as a positive step. We're not going to eliminate the divisions, but slowly, slowly, if people see other people as human beings and accept them, you know, I don't know the answer. Maybe one of the other panelists knows. I, I'm curious what how the Saudi media has been covering this. Are they showing different pictures? One of the little vignettes I saw is that I think a team, uh, a football soccer team in, in the UAE, assigned an Israeli player to a contract. That's it may sound like that's a tiny step, but an Israeli player playing in the Arab world uh, is something that hasn't happened before. So these are small things, but they're little steps towards hopefully ameliorating or softening some of the hard line positions and opening up human relations that hopefully can benefit the Palestinians as well as other people in the region. So I'm, I see it as an overall positive step, but fraught with huge issues uh, and myriad factors also coming into play here that are global. Uh, and I don't think we can underestimate uh, the effect of COVID what that means in cooperation potentially deal with this issue. I mean, it's reminded the world again of how connected we all are. Nobody can escape this. No country can escape it. It's really a matter of how we all deal with it. So again, these are big, truly historical events when you talk about history that, you know, it's too soon to make judgments on how the final outcome. Thank you, Robert. Uh, oh, go ahead, Alon. I'm just going to say, uh, this isn't directly to the question that was asked, but you know, I wouldn't hold my breath too much that the Emiratis and the Bahrainis are going to start pouring money into the West Bank either. Um, I think, you know, part of the, the, the genesis of the normalization of relations was their frustration with the Palestinians on a variety of issues, um, including negotiations with the Israelis. Um, and so I think the Palestinians have some work to do here also in uh, how they approach the Emiratis, how would they talk about this? And understandably, again, they're upset right now, but I think there needs to be uh, a different approach by the Palestinians to the Emiratis if we are to see the kinds of benefits and investment in Palestinian society in East Jerusalem, in Gaza, uh, because the Emiratis aren't going to do that if they're just going to be constantly condemned uh, by the Palestinians. They're just not going to be a reason for them to do that. Um, so, you know, it is important to, to also keep the pressure upon the Israelis, of course, and keep the pressure upon the Palestinians, and also for the U.S. to try and help leverage this deal in a way that is able to bridge some of the gaps that currently exist. Thank you, Alon. Dr. Benefshi, I want to follow up on what Robert said about Saudi Arabia and the media. You did point out that Bahrain agreeing to this deal clearly required Saudi Arabian approval. So could you talk a bit more on how the Saudi media is talking about this deal and the effects on its neighbors? Absolutely. There seems to be uh, some level of division within Saudi Arabia about how to publicly approach um, the deal. Um, privately, I can tell you um, that when you travel anywhere across the Arab world, uh, I, I've done that in, there, um, in some places more than others, there's um, a great deal of concern about the Palestinian cause on an Arab level, Arab to Arab level. 
Um, so I, I didn't mean in my earlier comments to dismiss that Pan-Arabism is dead. It's still, at least in the private sphere of people to people conversations very much alive. And uh, some of that even translates to anti-Americanism in, in the face of the accord. But the past, uh, the Saudi media has been trying to walk a very careful line while Saudi Arabia has not officially endorsed the accord. The media has done little gestures here and there to show that they are in agreement with the fundamentals of um, religious tolerance towards Jews, a, a broader piece in the Middle East be um, the idea of normalization is fine, that somehow the Palestinian cause has to be addressed, but that eventually um, the media, it looks of it, from the looks of it, is moving in the direction of, of preparing the Saudi public opinion uh, toward the ultimate reality that Saudi Arabia sooner or later will have to weigh in and officially do something about this accord. Saudi Arabia is a very uh, central country um, to the success of an accord or normalization with Israel, because as I pointed out, Saudi Arabia not only has weighed in the Gulf Arab countries with the UAE and Bahrain, but it also has weighed over Egypt, over Jordan, to some extent in Syria, and um, so sooner or later, it will have to figure out that stance. So it has been more accommodating than people might expect, but there seems to be some divisions of a political nature within the Saudi establishment over how to approach the issue. And that's not uncommon, usually on matters of foreign policy, there are maximum five to 10 people in Saudi Arabia who decide these questions. They're all members of the royal family. And once they are able to debate it over a couple of months, uh, understand what the interests, loss and benefits to the Saudi state are, I imagine that they would be able to articulate a more clear uh, stance um, toward the issue of uh, normalization. Thank you, thank you, Dr. Banashe. Uh, Alon, do you have uh, any comments on this? I, I just wanted to echo some of what Banashe was saying. Um, you know, Bahrain is actually connected to Saudi Arabia by a causeway. And, you know, I think, there, I don't think there's any way that Bahrain would have proceeded without uh, approval uh, by the Saudi king, and I think it's almost like a trial balloon to see to see what happens, how this plays out. Um, you know, a lot of the conventional wisdom that everybody's had, that we've all had with respect to the conflict uh, between the Israelis and the Palestinians, um, uh, has sort of been thrown out in some ways. And so, I think, uh, I think. The Saudi media is understandably going to be, you know, kind of on the fence with this, but ultimately, this is almost like a stealth normalization between Saudi Arabia and Israel. And I think in the years ahead, it's very tough to predict depending on how things play out, but I think this is definitely a step in that direction. If I may just point something out, which touches on what both Alan and Robert have been saying, the economy of this is really critical uh, in the longer haul. Uh, Saudi Arabia has economic weight and it is already exploring the merging of that economic weight with the United Arab Emirates, not just because Saudi Arabia needs the UAE, uh, or Bahrain need the UAE, but also because the UAE economy is not as strong as it used to be and also needs the Saudi economy and the Bahraini, uh, Bahraini's economy is weak. It needs foreign investments, but as Alon said, it is able to attract those investments very successfully. Um, so um, even uh, if we take the normalization out of the picture, these countries are merging their economies to an extent to contain Iran also to, uh, and their dependency on Iran, because as we know, the UAE economy has been very dependent on Iran. If you look at the accord between Israel and the UAE right now, they're talking about a trade volume of about 500, 500 million dollars in the immediate term, um, which isn't very much. Um, the UAE-Iranian um, 
trade uh, and re-export capacity was around $20 billion annually before the latest round of sanctions uh, kicked in against Iran. So uh, the United States has to, as Robert said, do a lot in order to boost the regional economic integration of the Arabs with the Israeli economy. And if that happens, well, we have uh, a more optimistic um, future ahead, I guess. Thank you, Dr. Uh, Benefshe. Uh, I would like to add to that, that part of the economic influence of Saudi Arabia and the UAE is also foreign workers who sent remittance to other Arab countries. And that's another huge uh, uh, power play that they have. But I do have a question, uh, Robert, you touched on this and it's Yemen. And I know a lot of our viewers are probably thinking uh, about this as well. Uh, we see when Israel enters this, we're assuming that Israel will be selling weapons to the UAE, to Bahrain as part of this uh, moving forward, just like we're seeing how they're selling weapons to Azerbaijan and it's changing the dynamics between Azerbaijan and Armenia. Uh, what are your takeaways on that? And what, how do you think it's gonna affect that region uh, military moving forward? Well, the US uh, is the supplier of weapons to the world. Uh, it's business uh, to be blunt and it's immoral frequently uh, and I think that, you know, the weapons trade in the Middle East is, is going to be one of the crucial elements here. And, and under the Trump administration, there's, there's almost no curtailing of how this was done. You know, the, the view of the Saudi, Saudi Arabia uh, in the U.S., after, especially after the Khashoggi murder, uh, it's almost been forgotten. Uh, by this administration or not really, it was not a matter of concern. So I think in terms of uh, a moral compass, uh, it's not a very strong compass uh, when it terms to weapon sales historically or in this part of the region. Uh, you know, this, we, we haven't even touched on it. There's a, there's a war in Libya now. The, you mentioned Azerbaijan and uh, the fighting there. Uh, Turkey's role in both places is interesting. Uh, and a lot of it, you know, weapons trade is up to billions of billions and billions and billions of dollars. I mean, uh, Trump had an event at the White House, you know, after this was signed with uh, Lockheed Martin's leaders. I think an F-35 fighter bomber was parked there. And, you know, he said, you know, why not sell them something? It's good for business. It's good for us. So if it seemed purely as a business relationship, uh, in business is frequently almost no morals or ethics. So uh, I don't see that changing, uh, but I do think hopefully uh, out of these accords, there will be cooperation on regional issues, whether they're around technology, water, uh, there's a, a pipeline the Israelis manage, you know, from the Red Sea to the Mediterranean that may be used uh, in a positive way. So hopefully some of these people, the people things will not offset the weapons trade and, and historically, but be also positive. And over time, maybe some of this will lessen. But as long as I think we have this dynamic of them and us uh, and, and, the, and the alliances that we see now that are based on fear and on one side, you know, the sworn destruction of a state, Israel, uh, until those declarations are either people accept Israel's right to exist, we're not gonna see any, I think, decline in any kind of sales, just a continued acceleration. Thank you, Robert. Uh, we do wanna ask a question. Uh, we do wanna move maybe a bit more to domestic policy. I know we haven't touched on that too much, but if all the panelists could talk a bit on how this affects Trump's reelection, whether with the evangelical base or with Jewish voters. Mm -hmm. I, I could just quickly say a few words. Um, with regard to Iran, they're waiting uh, to see the results of the US elections. And there's a large segment of the Iranian polity that hopes that uh, Vice President Biden will become the next president and become more accommodating toward Iran between now and then. And assuming that the Trump administration will remain in office, what the Iranians are doing despite their harsh rhetoric towards the um, Abraham Accord is actually being very cautious 
Um, they are not seeking a fight, uh, looking for a fight with anybody, not with Bahrain, not with the United Arab Emirates. They understand that the UAE and Bahrain are not looking for that fight because for this effort to flourish, there has to be regional peace. Otherwise, all the investments will go toward arm purchases and fighting a war. Israel, I don't think, has any intention of fighting a war with Iran unless the United States decides to pick that fight up. So because the Trump administration and the Biden, or future potential Biden administration, do not want to pick up that fight with Iran on a war-to-war -war level, um, then I think that in, as far as Iran's domestic um, developments are concerned, their approach is wait and see policy toward the U.S. elections and generally be cautious and try to see what opening might occur between the US and Iran in this process. Yeah, I'll just jump in. I think it'll have minimal impact on the US election. I think that uh, in, the, in the Jewish community, people who supported Trump are gonna support him and, uh, and those who don't, this isn't gonna make a difference. Uh, the evangelicals, uh, <laughs> Uh, again, I don't, I don't think this will swing many votes. I, and I, there's so many issues around that. So I don't think it'll have major impact on the U.S. election. I do think if, if there's a change in administration, uh, the Biden administration, I believe, would, would try and leverage a lot of these things and force uh, or at least push the Israelis in ways that the Trump administration is not. And also, we've talked a lot about economics, actually understand that economic improvement and improving the lives of people in the West Bank and Gaza, especially uh, because of investment and will do more in the long run and the short run to establish peace, maybe soften some of the hard line positions than anything else. So uh, whether the Trump administration would do that, I don't know. Uh, but I do think that the Biden administration, and he has said so himself, he sees this as not a bad thing. Uh, anytime you have quote unquote normalization uh, in a region that's been so fraught, uh, it's not, a, it's a positive step. We have a strange silence at the moment. Maybe we ought to say a little bit about the evangelicals. Alan, do you want to say something about it? Um, I'll just say that I agree with Robert. Um, you know, that I don't think the peace the peace deal in and of itself is going to do anything. Obviously, the moving of the embassy to Jerusalem and some other moves that the Trump administration has made um, have uh, reassured evangelicals that the Trump administration uh, supports the policies that they do. Um, uh, and yeah, I really, I just don't think this is going to have any impact on our domestic, uh, on our elections. Um, uh, yeah. 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 Uh, the, uh, the truth is that we're living in this country, in the U.S., in a not just a dramatic, quote unquote, soap opera, but one that shifts minute to minute to minute. And if you think, if we all start thinking about things that we thought were, oh, my God, this will change the election. Well, <laughs> it's like a waterfall or a cascade of events. So, uh, yeah, I, I think the Middle East is, is not a front burner issue. In fact, uh, foreign policy is barely a front burner issue. I mean, it's so focused on one man and his actions. Uh, you know, we could talk about all the various parts of the world and the US foreign policy and what shifted and really the move towards isolation. Uh, but uh, clearly, in my opinion, uh, whatever happened here in the Middle East, uh, is seen from not less a humanistic, let's do the right thing, but a business deal. And uh, how that, you know, it's, it's clearly how this administration and the president thinks. My only concern is that previous deals over the Palestinian issue and the Israeli-Palestinian issue really didn't uh, translate into economic deals, the ones that were made by the United States. Maybe Alon can speak better for that when it came to Camp David and the Egyptian-Israeli agreement. And um, but, but really, when I look at it on the ground, we've, our economic delivery policies have never been uh, ideal. Uh, far from perfect, and that has enabled other spoiler countries to move in and, and exert political influence over Palestinian factions, mm -hmm. etc. I don't know uh, what, what anyone thinks about this. 
it's just a thought on my mind and a concern. I'm yeah, not, I think uh, you're right. Uh, no, I mean, why don't you mention that? Also, there's a, I'm looking at the questions because uh, our moderator froze. Oh, there he's back. But I, Alan, maybe you can also follow up on, on how pressure or how, there's a question from a listener on, on the PA, you know, how they can be brought into the fold here. And, and is there, are there ongoing other secret or private talks that you're aware of now happening on that? No, uh, um, you know, there are always some talks going on in the background, but I think that um, right now the U.S. doesn't have a tremendous amount of leverage with the Palestinians. We closed our the PLO office in, um, in Washington. We've cut off aid. And so really the way to get leverage from the Palestinians would be through some of the other Arab states. And that's something that uh, the Emiratis could be working on with the Saudis, for example. Um, the U.S. could work with the Europeans, and I think that is happening. But right now, I think we need the, the Palestinians are, are it's going to take some time to get over this. It's going to take, they're obviously waiting to see what happens uh, with our elections. And uh, it's not pleasant to say this, but Mahmoud Abbas is old uh, and there will be a transition soon uh, of power in the West Bank. And I think everybody's just in a holding pattern to see what happens. And once we know kind of the outcome of uh, the Palestinian power uh, transition, what happens in the US elections, which we'll know much sooner, uh, and how the Emiratis are able to leverage their place in the Arab world uh, and now their, their relations with Israel. Once we see how the dust settles on that, I think there'll be a lot of different ways where pressure can be brought on the Palestinians um, if needed. Thank you, Alon. Uh, sorry about that. Uh, my internet, uh, I had problems with the internet. Uh, uh, we'd like to remind our audience that this is a Commonwealth Club uh, program called the UAE and Bahrain deals with Israel with Dr. Benefshe Kainouche, Robert Rosenthal, and Alon Sakar. Uh, we do have a question uh, about, I don't know if it was asked while, while, while I was have internet, uh, having internet issues, but about Qatar's role. And we understand how Qatar tried to lean back on Turkey. Now we see the UAE and Bahrain uh, leaning back on Israel. Uh, any, if anybody wants to comment on how they see Qatar moving forward, within this region, given the new dynamics. Qatar's prime, oh, excuse me, if anyone wants to go forward. Go ahead, go Doctor. Qatar, I'll just be quick. Qatar's primary uh, interest is its relationship with the United States and to have the, uh, the extent of the leverage it needs on the US-Qatari relationship to be able to advance Qatar's regional policies, be it in the Gulf region, Persian Gulf region, or more broadly in areas where it competes with the United Arab Emirates in North Africa, in the Horn of Africa, et cetera, to an extent, um, not very much. And that is why it's also banding with Turkey to advance mutual interests with the United States. Um, I'll let others speak more about it. Thank you, Dr. Uh, Benefshe. Uh, I do wanna follow up on one thing that I know Robert uh, touched on and that is Hezbollah. Given this new dynamic and uh, these alliances, how do we see that moving forward within the region? Do we see more pressure by Iran against with uh, using Hezbollah uh, attacking Israel, et cetera? Or do we see this more of a situation where, where uh, Israeli uh, weapons are gonna be used in, with the UAE uh, and Bahrain to try to neutralize any advances by uh, uh, Iran and Hezbollah? Well, I'll start. Uh, you know, that it's, it's a, obviously a tinderbox. And I think, you know, if a war started, uh, a hot war in Lebanon uh, with Israeli, Israel and, and Hezbollah, it, it would be lead to massive and horrific destruction, clearly uh, of Lebanon and also from what we believe to be true, the, the amount of missiles, et cetera, that, that uh, Hezbollah has in uh, Lebanon. It would be a disaster for the entire region and potentially pull in others. Uh, so uh, no, I don't think anyone wants that, but I do think 
clearly Hezbollah, in a sense, has been bled by its fighting in Syria. The weak, weakness, economic weakness of Iran has created status, and obviously, the, the, you know, what's happened in Lebanon. Um, it's, it's just one of those things that it could explode at any time. And as long as uh, I think Hezbollah and the Israelis see each other as mortal enemies, and then by extension, Iran, it's always going to be, be have the potential for tremendous unrest. Whether the Israelis covertly or directly get weapons to the UAE or the US does it in Bahrain, clearly from the Iranian point of view, it's a provocation. Uh, you know, the, the U.S. bases in UAE are, that were created after the first Gulf War, uh, you know, the Iranians are not happy about it. So they see themselves being enclosed and encircled. So I don't see a positive outcome there. But right now, there's, I think there's tremendous, uh, not only a, a weakening of Hezbollah in a sense, politically and militarily, but also the realization that if there was a war with Israel, it would be brutal. And I'm not sure who, if there's e even potentially any winner there, just massive, massive destruction and death uh, of Lebanon and, and I think tremendous damage to Israel. Thank you, Robert. Go ahead, I'll just add that, you know, the Emiratis are deeply invested in Lebanon. And I think, you know, it's hard to predict whether this agreement is going to embolden them to do anything more either in Lebanon or elsewhere. And really what we have to wait for is the first crisis and to see how they react and how, what, if there is any difference in how forward they are trying to be in pressuring other governments in the region or trying to preserve their interests in various ways. So it's, it's hard to it's hard to know um, exactly how forthcoming or how uh, aggressive the Emiratis are going to be, and how much this is going to change their foreign policy just in general in the region. Yeah. Thank you, Alon. Uh, okay, uh, I'll give uh, Benefshe uh, the last uh, reply. We are running out of time, unfortunately, and we'll we'll close it off with Dr. Benefshe. Sorry, I didn't mean to take to take the floor, but I'll be quick just to the points that you've been making at the Commonwealth Club. Hezbollah is. Um, pretty much contained in Lebanon right at the moment in many respects. It's, 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 uh, it's, its position is um, difficult. It must be seen as part of Lebanese politics first and foremost, rather than an agency of the Iranian government. And so my prediction is what the other speakers have been saying that it's, um, you know, they're just gonna wait and see and they're gonna be very cautious and um, they do have options in, to destabilize Israel. They do have options to destabilize the Palestinian territories. But the very fact that they haven't used those options means that um, right now the security risk of going down that path is much higher than, than appeasement. Um, and so there, I think we, we'll witness some quiet periods until we see how the Abraham Accords will ultimately reshift the power dynamics, I guess, in the region. Thank you. Uh, thanks to our distinguished panelists, Dr. Benefshike Noush, Alon Sakar, and Robert Rosenthal for their contributions to today's program. The UAE and Bahrain deals with Israel. Now, this meeting of the Commonwealth Club of California, celebrating over 116 years of enlightened discussion, is adjourned. <laughs>